Hey, what's up, buddy? How you doing? Man, we are always in the exact same mood. Hey folks, today I'm abstaining from saying, today we're doing something a little bit different, and it is incredibly difficult. Instead of doing, this is something different. I thought we could do something more bluegrass guitar related. So we're going to talk about turning bluegrass licks into bluegrass language. Cool title, right? I've had a couple questions about that in the past, like this how to turn licks into breaks kind of thing. Um, anyway, so I thought I'd break it down for you today. The answer probably isn't as simple as you'd like, but the premise itself is very simple. It's hard to speak a language from a phrase book. So to speak bluegrass, we need to break it up into smaller chunks. We're going to do that by taking licks from the Instagram account I help run. Grass and grass. And then break them down step by step until we're working with words and phrases. Anyway, here we go. So before we get into the licks, I want to kind of address what we're looking for and how you can find those things in bluegrass and other genres in order to create an authentic language. A quick note is that this lesson is like a lot of music instruction. That is to say, it's just one method of doing things. You could do things a lot of different ways and get to the same ending point. That's kind of what's beautiful about teaching people, right? Uh, different people learn different ways, different strokes for different folks. First off, we want to look for a bone structure. It's very difficult to become fluent in a you know new musical language if we don't have a way to map it onto our instrument. We can do this by checking all the usual suspect scales against our lick and seeing which one kind of fits over it most effectively. So think about your major pentatonic, your minor pentatonic, your major scale, your minor scale, all of your modes, all of your mode variations, so on and so forth. This list could go on for a long time. Now, if scales aren't working when you try to lay them over the lick, you might be dealing with a genre or something that's more arpeggio related, in which case follow the same thing, major arpeggios, minor arpeggios, so on and so forth. Or you might be dealing with something that's super outside and experimental, in which case good luck. Next we need to find what I'm going to call sequencing, and when I say sequencing I mean that in a really broad sense. Right in this passage or in this lick, is it common for the scale to be played straight through or is it tailored to the chord? Is it played with non-consecutive scale tones or consecutive scale tones? Is there a common pattern that gets used a lot? Are the lines rhythmically syncopated or are they constant eighth notes or sixteenth notes? Right, We really want to be able to recognize the cadence of this new language. How is it laid out? After that we want to look for the outside note choice that's lending the kind of spice or flavor to the music, if there is any at all. So when you hear no outside notes, you can think of something like uh, Turkey in the Straw or Mary Had a Little Lamb. For minor thirds and dominant sevens, you can think of like the hot bluegrass that you're used to hearing. Uh, for minor chords with uh, sixths on them, you can think of that gypsy jazz sound. And I guess I, I don't want this list to go on for a long time, but if I if I wanted to just in a broader sense, you know, think about your flat nines, your sharp nines, and like your sharp fours and that kind of stuff, you can think of like maybe bebop jazz or something. But there's so many different genres that we could reference and what's common in them, and there's just no way I could give it to you all right now. So I'm going to cut this list short. Now, I'm not a huge fan of the like language learning and music symbolism or metaphors. I think that they tend to break down at some point and then they become kind of not useful. I guess I'll use them for this video. So you can think of our first step of finding the scale is like an alphabet. You can think of our second step of finding the sequencing. You can think of that as like your sentence structure. And that last step where we're looking for those spice notes, right? We're looking for the things that kind of stand out, the flavors. You can think of that as like your vocabulary. All right, so here's our first example. This is the first lick we're gonna try to deconstruct. And then instead of it just being a lick, it's gonna become a language. Here we go. First, let's analyze. So I'm thinking about the alphabet right now. And just by using my ears and getting a quick read through of this lick, I can definitely rule out the G major scale, uh, the G major pentatonic, and a handful of the major modes. This lick is definitely in the minor camp. So my first minor guesses would be your normal minor scale, your minor pentatonic, and a couple minor modes. Now I'm going to get complex for just a second for all the nerds out there, because if I don't, I'm going to get so many comments about this. So first off, I'm comparing this lick to my G minor 
Gardner scale to my uh, G Dorian mode and my G Phrygian mode, okay? So first off, I know this lick is not Phrygian mm. because it contains a major second degree and the minor second degree is kind of essential to that Phrygian sound. So it's not that. Now, I also know it's not Dorian mm. because it doesn't contain a flatted sixth interval, which is kind of that important part of Dorian. In fact, it contains no sixth at all, which is why I'm not going to call it in the minor scale either mm. because we can't tell what kind of sixth it has. For that reason, I'm going to go with the G minor pentatonic for my bone structure or alphabet. So now I'm going to think about my sentence structure. How is the lick sequenced or constructed? And once again, like earlier, I mean that in a really broad sense. These are the things I notice right away when I look at the lick. First of all, the first four groupings of eighth notes have this kind of backstepping pattern. It's like descend four notes, uh, jump back up, descend four notes, jump back up, descend four notes. And I also noticed that the end of the lick has a rep repetition of two notes multiple times. Um, there's there's more I could say just by looking at this, but I'm not going to say it. I want to make sure that this is all really palatable. So let's move on. But lastly, I'm looking for my vocabulary. I'm looking for those distinctive notes, and I'm looking for maybe short two to three note phrases. The first weird note we find in this lick is the flat five or D flat note in the first group of eighth notes. Now, if you know anything about turning your minor pentatonic scales into blue scales, then you know that this is the characteristic blue note. Now, one thing that's important to note is that in this lick, those three notes never appear consecutively. So you don't get first fret, second fret, third fret. It's all broken up. The next note outside of our G minor pentatonic is the major third, which is, where is it? It's in the second measure. That means that even though we're using the minor pentatonic as our bone structure, we're trying to acknowledge the major chord that we're playing over. This ambiguous third kind of movement with the minor third and the major third, it happens again at the end of the lick. Now, it's worth noting that once again, you don't get all of those notes in sequence. You don't get open first fret, second fret on your A string. It never happens that way. So obviously that's something that we want to carry over when we start improvising with all of these tools. Okay, so that's a lot of deconstruction and that's kind of all good, but how do we practice this? Well, let's go through our three sections one by one and let's try to come up with a practice routine. First of all, we want to be really familiar with our alphabet or bone structure, but please do not practice it like this. <laughs> So before we do anything else, we want to make sure that we can improvise with just our alphabet. So we want to try to use consistent eighth notes, create um, a coherent line with no big jumps or non sequiturs in it. And because this is a creative exercise, but it might sound something like this. If you can't do that well, consistently. If you couldn't do that forever, stop here. Really practice that. The rest of this is going to be really hard if you can't already do that first step. And that first step is a doozy. <laughs> Watch out for that first step. It's a doozy. <laughs> This is hard. I'm not saying that this is easy. This is hard work, but you should really, really try to nail that first step before we move on. I know it can be monotonous. I know it can be boring. I know it's hard to sound musical, but that's just where everyone has to start, and that's our baseline, okay? So after we can do that, we want to look at our sequencing, or what I call sentence structure. So the big thing we saw in this lick was the backstepping, where we would descend four, and then hop back up, and descend four again, right? I'm going to take that as a really loose concept. I'm not going to say that I have to descend a specific set of four notes or that I have to jump back up a specific amount or anything like that. I'm leaving this open because I want to think creatively with it. Now I'm going to mix it into my pentatonic improvising and I want you to try to listen really hard to see when I'm just creating my own line and when I'm mixing in this backstepping idea. <laughs> All right, so believe it or not, we're actually getting really close to the sound of bluegrass. What we're missing is all of that spice. So next, we want to think about our extended note choice, right? Our, our vocabulary. So what I'm going to use first is I'm going to use that flat five degree. It was a uh, C sharp or D flat, depending on how you want to look at that, or a second fret on your B string if you're looking at it in the same place that I am. Um, I'm going to mix that in with my minor pentatonic and my sequencing, and I think you're going to kind of hear how I'm getting close to that sound now. <laughs> Thank you. 
Next, I'm going to add in this super important chord tone, and that's the major third. B natural or fourth fret on your G string if you want to find it somewhere specific. So if I add that to my improvising, I can now do something that more or less has the same attitude of the original lick, but I can make it last as long or as short as I want, and I can kind of control how much of each ingredient I add in whenever I play it. That sounds like this. Now this is how a lot of great players use licks. Not only do they learn the lick the way it came to them, all packaged up by someone else, but they try to absorb every little piece of information contained in the lick until they can replicate the language, say whatever they want to say, and not what came in the phrase book when they tried to learn it. All right, so I'm going to give you one more example of this kind of breakdown. So here's the second lick we're going to work on. First, we analyze. All right, so once again, we're thinking about our alphabet or that scale or that arpeggio first. That's what we're looking for. I'm going to immediately check all my scales. And after kind of looking at this tab and thinking about it, this is definitely more of a, a major sound. And that means that the short list of scales I can try against it is probably my C major scale, my C major pentatonic, um, a couple modes, and that's it. W once again, just for the nerds out there, it's definitely not Lydian because Lydian has a sharp fourth degree and that kind of controls when something is Lydian or not. And because the fourth doesn't appear, anywhere in this lick. I, I can't say that it's Lydian. I also wouldn't call it the major scale because mm -hmm. the lick strongly hits the dominant seventh. And because it hits that dominant seventh so hard and purposefully, I, I can't say it's the major scale. Um, so that means it's either the C major pentatonic or maybe a C mixolydian, right? Because of that dominant seventh. But because the fourth doesn't show up at all, I'm not going to go with mixolydian, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with the pentatonic, and I think it's going to be just as easy to see as last time if I do that. <laughs> Okay, cool. On to the sentence structure. This lick is undeniably crafted in a totally different way than the last lick we looked at. To start, we have multiple three note per string chromatic passages to open the lick. That didn't happen last time. After that, we have a slightly repetitive pull off section, it looks like. Right, it kind of repeats, but it's not exactly the same every time. It kind of evolves. And that's really important to note when you see that, right? Is it repeating exactly the same every time or is it changing? After that, we have, oh, a bunch of uh, repeated notes at the end, just like last time. But this definitely has a different attitude than last time, and we're going to try to get inside that. Okay, so last up, what are the weird notes in this lick? Where's the spice? Well, initially, we do have those chromatic movements, but I'm not sure the in-between notes themselves are super important. I feel like we're just linking up the different sides of the pentatonic scale. The weird note is kind of just a passing tone, right? We're just passing by it. We're landing on something that's really stable and solid. Then there's a lot of uh, play with the minor third and that uh, pull-off section that kind of repeats and changes. And then at the end as well, um, we're familiar with that from our last lick, right? Lastly, the, the dominant seventh note is that last note in the second measure. Okay, so we'll want to include a little bit of B-flat in there when we get to improvising. It also looks like the B-flat slides down to the sixth too, so maybe we'll want to do that in our improvisation. Okay, deconstruction over. Let's start practicing again. Alright, first off, we got to get fluent with our alpha Bit. And this time it's the C major pentatonic. Just like last time, we don't just want to ascend and descend. We want to try to create a line with it, right? Once again, if this is difficult, stop. Stay on this step. This might be tough. This might be a one-day thing, a two-day thing. Uh, three week thing. Doesn't matter. It's going to be hard to do the rest of this if you can't improvise a fluent line for an unspecified amount of time with the pentatonic scale. So next, of course, we want to look at our sequencing or sentence structure. I'm going to latch on the kind of evolving uh, repetitious pull-offs as my phrasing item, and I'm going to try to include that into my pentatonic line. So when you're listening to this, look for when I'm using those pull-offs to create something that kind of uh, runs in a circle for a second. <laughs> Finally, I'm looking for that spicy vocab again. Um, the three things we latched onto were the minor third, the flat seventh, and oh, that chromaticism in the three note groupings at the very beginning. So let's put all of that together, shall we? <laughs> Ha 
that's the idea. Take a lick, turn it into a language that you can speak. And then you don't just have a bag of tricks. It's not just a couple dozen licks that you've memorized. Now your, your language that you speak is whatever you want it to be, whenever you want it to be. You just dial into this attitude of what you're going to include and you mix it up just in the moment. All right, enough of that. Uh, if you like taking a lesson from the biggest, baddest Billy Goat in the barnyard, there's a couple things you can do. Number one, you can scroll down. You can subscribe to this channel. You can give this video a like. You can also leave me a comment down below. Let me know what I did right and what I did wrong. You can also find me in the big three main places that you find everyone. Uh, other than that, you can check out my Instagram account, Jazz and Grass. That's a new lick every single weekday, alternating between bluegrass and jazz. I run that with my friend Lyman Lipke. And when you're done with that, you can check out my website, LessonsWithMarcel.com. Bunch of free stuff on there. That is everything I have to say. I'll see you next time.